You can never move beyond being a foreigner. That was my mistake with that. And that's the only thing you can ever do. Hey guys, in this video, I interview somebody named Nick. Nick's an American who's currently working as a professional Japanese comedian. He belongs to arguably the most prestigious comedy production company in Japan, Yoshimoto Kogyo, and the style of comedy that he does is manzai, which is a unique form of Japanese comedy which is completely reliant upon hyper-fluent Japanese ability. So, needless to say, he's extremely fluent in Japanese. So, in 2008年に来て、で、その前にちょっとだけ日本語勉強してて、で、2008年日本に来て2年間日本語学に行ってたんですよ。あ、こっちの。そう。Nick's also one of the stars of a popular Japanese children's TV show, as well as a musician and a father. In the interview, we covered a bunch of interesting topics, such as some of the usual stuff, like what it's like to reach extremely high levels of Japanese ability and what it's like to live in Japan as a foreigner, but also a lot of brand new things to this channel, such as the differences between Japanese style comedy and Western style comedy, what it's like to become a professional Japanese comedian and what that process looks like, what manzai actually is and how it really works, the inner workings of the world of Japanese celebrities, and much more. So I really hope you guys enjoy this interview. If you do, then please don't forget to like, subscribe, and check out the Mass Immersion Approach Patreon. So with that out of the way, let's jump into the interview. How are you doing today, Nick? Hey, what's up, Matt? Nice to meet you. This is the first time we've talked, actually. Yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks so much for doing this. Do you want to give a quick introduction to everyone? Yeah, sure. So it seems that you heard me on the Bilingual News podcast, which is, I think... I think it's the biggest podcast in Japan, I'm not sure, but uh, I've been in Japan for um, since about 2008, maybe even a little longer, um, and I've been doing manzai, which is Japanese stand-up comedy. Um, obviously, I'm not doing it now because uh, there's no shows go going on to, mm -hmm. due to uh, corona, but um, you know, yeah, yeah, I've been here, I've been doing comedy, I do some TV shows, um, I write some scripts, um, yeah, mostly educational stuff, though for, you know, TV wise. Cool, cool. Yeah. So I've always been a, well, I wouldn't say always been a big fan, but I've always been a, a <laughs> astute observer of Japanese television. So I'm really excited to get to ex explore your personal experiences with that. But let's just start with your initial interest in Japan. When did you first decide that you wanted to go to Japan or learn Japanese? So I uh, loved Japan since I was a little kid. Uh, you know, I was into anime when I, uh, I don't know how old you are, but how old are you? I'm 25. Okay, so I'm 33 and turning 34, and uh, on the Sci-Fi Channel, there, there was this thing called like Saturday Morning Anime, and there were you know animes like Galaxy Express or Hokuto no Ken and Akira and all these really obscure uh, like 80s and 90s anime, and they were really violent, and I was like, whoa, this is completely different than American cartoons. There's blood and people die. This is so cool. And then uh, when I was in middle school, I started watching you know Kurosawa Akira. You know, Yojimbo and Shichin no Samurai and all that type of stuff. And I really got into Samurai and then it just progressed. And then when I entered university, I started studying Japanese. Oh, cool, cool. So when you first started studying Japanese, was it just kind of kind of like you wanted to get a, more of an inside look on this culture that you've always been interested in? Or did you have in mind that you wanted to go to Japan and try living there? Um, well, I did. Uh, so I missed one important thing. My uh, math teacher, and she actually taught a little bit of Japanese too. Uh, my math teacher in high school was Japanese and she really influenced, uh, she taught me Japanese too, like, you know, words and stuff like that. Um, so uh, yeah, after high school, I was like, you know, the only thing I'm interested in is Japan. Um, you know, I was never really good at math. Uh, you know, I'm you know, all right with history and stuff, but I was really interested in Japan and I knew it was something that I could keep studying, which is why I chose Japan. And I'd been to Japan in high school a couple of times. So. Oh yeah. Was that just kind of like a couple week vacation or? Yeah, it was with the teacher actually, the Japanese teacher. She, she took a bunch of kids that were interested in Japan. And also there were foreign exchange students from Japan in my high school. So, you know. Okay, cool. So you, so you did have a pretty good number of connections yeah. and things like that to Japanese yeah. culture. And then, so you were going to college in the United States? Yeah, I went to University of San Francisco. Um, it had a really good Japanese program, um, not just language-wise, but, you know, Japanese studies program. And, you know, when you graduate from that, you're like, uh, and I was never the type of person that really thought about my future too much. I wish I would have thought about it a little bit more. But uh, it's really hard to just get a job from Japanese studies. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. there's no skills that you know it's not like you can do accounting or you know business or you know yeah and so and we should probably 
just say that yeah you're american uh in case everyone was wondering if you were like a british guy doing an impeccable american accent or something but no, yeah yeah i'm american i'm full american it's funny because uh J- you know japanese people always ask am i half japanese or you know things like that <laughs> yeah i get that a lot too which is funny because i don't think i look japanese at all and yeah you don't look very japanese either no but anyway so then what did you end up doing after you finished this japanese program and maybe knew a little bit of japanese but didn't have any other applicable skills Okay, so I didn't, uh, so, you know, I knew probably, you know, like the average amount of Japanese as a normal Japanese learner, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I went to a, a language school called ARC Academy in Shinjuku. I think it's still around. And these language schools are really good because the teachers can't speak any English and the other students are all Chinese. So they're learning kanji like 10 times faster than you are. <laughs> and you're like, you know, no, nah, no, nah, I want to get as good as that they mm-hmm. are. You know, I'm going to study like three times as hard. So you study really hard for six months and you get really good. And then to tell you the truth, and I don't know if I'd ever recommend this for anybody, but after that, I lost my visa and I needed a visa. So I went to a Senmon Gakko, which is like a technical school in Japan. And uh, they're everywhere here. And I went to one for comedy. Um, it was It's pretty well known. It was a two-year course. And... Uh, you learn how to do manza, you learn how to do, you know, just uh, performance and stuff like that. And uh, when you learn how to do comedy, especially Japanese comedy, you know, it's all scripted. So you're writing in Japanese, you're reading in Japanese, and you're speaking in Japanese, and you're trying to be funny in Japanese, you know, every day. It it was actually much harder than any university I've ever been to. So, okay, so just to back up for a little bit, so you were at the language school for six months? Yeah. To get into this school, I had to pass the Noryokushiken. I see the, the, like, JLPT? Yeah, yeah, the JLPT. Was that N2? Uh, I think it was just N2, yeah. I never even bothered for N1. I, didn't, I don't feel like I need it. So that's really interesting that you, you're kind of saying that the reason that you went into the Senmon Gakko to learn Japanese comedy was for getting a visa. Yes. But it seems like this ended up being a pretty big decision in your life that really swayed the way that your future went from that point. Yeah. So... Like looking back, like I'm, I'm curious. Like, were you interested in Japanese comedy, like at least a little bit? Like, what was your outlook at that time? So, um, the Japanese entertainment industry was really cool when I think I was in college. You know, watching old shows, it's all crazy. But now it kind of has started sucking because there's so many people complaining. Like, I'm offended by this and I'm offended by that and stuff like that. But the thing about Japanese comedy, the <laughs> genokai behind the scenes is not very bright it's super dark um you know even in the boot camp kids were crying you know tons of people just dropped out by the end of the uh the year i think there was like five of us or something like that who made it through yeah 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 like the teacher how many people were like assigned up for it at the beginning i don't know maybe it was like 30 okay so that's yeah pretty high dropout rate uh and i was i didn't sign up at the beginning either because every friday night till like really late at night you have to show your joke and the teacher he he's actually been removed but he was really good but he would you know say you know go kill yourself or stuff like that like it it was like it wasn't not american education this is like feels like you're in the army or something like that dang dang yeah and so so this is this type of school is what they call owarai yoseijo right yeah owarai yoseijo yeah so yeah, it's in to translate that, it would be like comedian cultivation facility yes. almost. Where yes, yes, yes. Uh, and and so my I actually don't know very much about this at all. But my impression was that once you get into this program, they are going to really take care of you. And as long as you don't drop out or you don't like really just suck, then you basically kind of some kind of guaranteed like pathway to become a comedian. Like they're going to give you a manager, they're going to find you gigs and, and they're going to help you debut and find out like what type of style you're going to go for and stuff like that. And so you're nodding. So I'm assuming that that is kind of correct. Yes. So there's two types of these schools. There's independent ones. Mine was an independent one and they do, they really take care of you. You're doing auditions and you get like, you know, 10, it depends on, you know, how good you are, but you get a bunch of companies looking for you through this school. The other way to do it is you go to the comedy schools that are attached to the companies. Like in Japan with universities, there's all the way down to like daycare that's connected to the university. So the kids are basically guaranteed to get into that really good university. Yeah, they call it like an elevator system, right? 
Yes, yes. And it's just like that with the comedy schools. But I chose to do this independent one because you actually get a degree. Um, with the connected comedy schools, you don't get any degree or anything like that. It's not recognized. But you do get into Yoshimoto almost 100% Watanabe Pro, which is, I think, the best company in Japan. You aren't guaranteed, but you have a pretty good chance. But I got scouted by a bunch of uh, different places. We had already gone on TV while we were students, me and my partner. Um, and I don't know how we pulled that off, but we got really lucky. So it was really easy for us to uh, get into some companies. Cool, cool. And so I would guess that it's easier to get into the independent schools than to get into the ones that are directly connected to the company. Because if you get into the one directly to connect to the company, the company is like stuck with you in a way, right? And so it seems like they would have a higher barrier to entry. Uh, it, it's the opposite. Oh, really? It's the opposite. Yeah, yeah. The thing about the schools connected to the companies is they're just as strict as the independent school. They're probably even more strict. So there's a higher chance you're going to drop out and they still get the Nijuman N or Sanjuman, Yonjuman N that you paid for. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's easier to get in the school, but it might be harder to get in the company. With the independent one, you have to take, you know, tests, you, you know, like the, like I said, you know, the JLPT, there's, you know, an entrance exam and stuff like any other like university kind of. So you're not guaranteed to get into the independent ones. I see. So you said there was 30 people in your kind of class, right? Yeah. So out of those, how many were foreigners? Uh, none. There, there were foreigners that obviously you probably predict this. What do you think in the all of the Japanese entertainment industry would have the most like people applying, including Japanese and foreigners? What do you think? Um... It's seiyu. So it's voice acting. Ah, uh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, voice acting is also a lot less strict. So the orai, some part of the genokai, is the strictest part. Every other part's you know still annoying, but it's nowhere near the same. So more normal people can become seiyu. There's more you know anime is a lot more popular than orai is now, and a lot of the seiyu who were foreigners were Chinese. They weren't there weren't any like you know Americans there. No, I was the only person in the whole school. Well, wow, that's that's really interesting. So because my impression would be that comedy would be more popular than anime right now because it seems like in my mind well it kind of depends on the anime i know like some anime like one piece has really broad appeal and it's really popular uh -huh. but my impression was that comedy was a pretty big thing in japan but you feel like that's not necessarily the case oh anime is way bigger there's not even a comparison i mean even just on the like oh really the, yeah 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 it's i mean comedy is comedy's not big now it's been bigger in the past but i don't think it's ever going to reach the point of anime even within Japan, because I can totally see how when you're looking at the worldwide appeal, anime is going to be a lot stronger because no one outside of Japan watches Japanese comedy because the language barrier yeah. it doesn't translate. But I know anime is popular all over the world. But even with within Japan, you you say that anime is still like a, a lot bigger uh, industry than comedy. Yeah, I'd say nine, 95 percent of the school were people trying to become voice actors. Oh, wow, that, that's super interesting. Yeah. And so... Do you feel like because there wasn't even necessarily that many foreigners trying to apply to, to become a comedian that it was, wasn't hard for you to get in? Or did you have to kind of prove yourself? And it, like you said, you needed to have the JLPT, but were they pretty open to accepting a foreigner into the school? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were. Because, I mean, there's if you don't look Japanese and you're trying to, you know, stand out, it's much easier, right? So it looks good for them, too, if you get famous, you know. I see. Yeah, the, that's pretty interesting. And so you mentioned that you had a partner. So how did you meet your partner and who is who is this person? So dude, I, I still work with him. Um, I've known him since he was, he was either 17 or 18. So it's been 10 or 11 years. And uh, um, like I said, I, I, you didn't have to do the comedy like full, full on at this school, only if you wanted to and only a couple you know, not many people did, but he did. And I did it halfway through because I got bored. I was like, God, what am I doing with my life? I'm like 22 or I forgot I said maybe 23. And I was like, maybe I should just try it out. So his partner, I'll tell you a funny story. So the day I said I wanted to start being a comedian, mm -hmm. there was like, after every show at the school, you had to, I don't, you know, I'm not going to say the name of the school because they might, you know, the teacher could get in trouble, whatever. You had to stay out till five in the morning and watch him drink, the teacher who taught us. And it was hell, man. It was hell. Anyway, 
Not many people follow this, but my Japanese partner's ex-partner in Japan, when you cheer somebody, this is my, this is my son's, by the way, this isn't mine. But uh, when you cheer somebody who's above you, your cup has to be below theirs, like this. Mm -hmm. And his ex-partner cheered the teacher like this, not thinking. Like, you know, it was like three in the morning and he was tired and probably not thinking. The teacher starts yelling at him. He's like, what the hell are you doing? You know, screaming at him, makes him sit in Seiza, you know, because we always had to sit in Seiza. Mm -hmm. um, and he was just crying and the next day he signed off. And that's the day that I signed up. So we needed a new partner. Yeah, yeah. I was so naive that uh, I told them, you know, if you join with me, we're going to get famous really fast. You know, I, I had no idea about anything. But uh, we still have been working. And, you know, four months, five months after that, there was a thing called the Ora Shinjin Ege Taisho on NHK. And, you know, all the comedians in Japan are on it. And somehow we got to the top four. Wow. And then after that, we started getting called on to stuff. And so this partner you're working with is a Japanese person? Yeah, he's a Japanese person, man. And when you're working with somebody who, you know, I've... Right now, I'm spending more time with my family, but I've spent more time with him than I've, you know, ever, besides probably my mom and my dad. Um, you know, before shows and stuff, you're getting into fist fights. And, and this is, like, normal. You know, this is, like... Because you're with each other all the time, you know? So... Mm -hmm the bond is uh, pretty strong. Yeah, I, I can imagine. And so you said you, that you knew him since you were a teenager. So was he like a foreign exchange student at your high school or? Uh, so I knew him since he was a teenager. So he just graduated high school when he joined this school. Okay, so he's really younger. I already graduated university and stuff. Yeah. I see. Okay, cool, cool. So I was already much uh, older than him, but he was just, it happened to be, you know, he was the only guy who didn't have a partner at that time. And he wanted to do manzai and I wanted to do manzai. So we got put together. I mean, it's, it's so crazy. I mean, it's such a long time ago, it feels like. And I, I was so naive about it. I mean, I just didn't know about Japan enough. Like once I joined the school and started really getting into the comedy, then I was like, okay, this is what Japanese culture is. This is how Japanese people interact with each other. I didn't know any of that before, you know. So when you say that, you're not talking about the content of the comedy, but you're talking about how the system of the school worked as an organization? I'm talking about the content of the comedy, uh, what type of conversations are just appropriate for people who aren't family members. Like, you know, we talk about, I think, uh, Americans are much more open about their private lives, mm -hmm. uh, a lot more emotion, like show a lot more emotion. It's just completely different in Japan. And a lot of guys that come to Japan, you know, as an English teacher, they're interacting with either only foreigners or Japanese people who have been uh, exposed. I hope I'm not sounding like didactic or anything like that. But, uh, <laughs> exposed to foreigners but uh it's it's just completely different culture you know the way people act interact with each other you know yeah yeah and so like what did your experiences look like when you were learning these things like were you were you learning through making mistakes and realizing like oops that clearly was a uh, not the right thing to do socially based on the reaction yes. that i got or yes like i'll never forget the time when i um i was a student and one of the teachers were talking and i I was in a chair and I crossed my legs and in Japan it's super disrespectful to cross your legs and I got yelled at so hard I like I wanted to cry I <laughs> a lot of lessons learned the hard way yeah yeah and so I'm, I'm also just really curious what were they really teaching you at this school like were there just lessons and were there classes where you were taking notes or did you study famous comedians in the past or like, what were you really doing okay so they start with uh like Charlie Chaplin okay interesting and you look at really old uh, American and Western comedy, and then it's, uh, you know, pantomime, dance, because it's really rhythmic, manzai. Um, stuff that you would think never has to do with comedy. And then the main thing is, it's called netamise, where you show your joke, and you still do this when you're doing it professionally, too. Um, I haven't done it because, obviously, uh, COVID-19 makes it so we can't go to our company. But even now, twice a month, we have to show a joke to all the managers. A new joke? Or could it be a polished version of a previous joke? Yeah, a new joke. Yes, yes. So you make a new joke every month and a joke is usually three to five minutes. Five min minutes is even pretty long. But uh, that's where you get good at speaking Japanese if you're not Japanese because you learn how to uh, deliver you know, jokes. Mm -hmm. you, you learn the timing, you learn 
And you're with a Japanese guy right next to you. So it's like, you know, speed learning. Have you ever heard of that? You know, while you're sleeping, you know, you put oh, it yeah. in your ears or whatever. It's like natural speed <laughs> learning because there's just some guy next to you, you know, 12 hours a day and you're hearing how they talk, you know? Yeah, yeah. That sounds like a really awesome situation for learning Japanese. Yeah. And, and, and I'm just so curious about this. So And so for the school, was this particularly for manzai or were there like different paths you could go within the school? Like one, if you wanted to do konto or manzai or how did that work? You're right. So there's guys that do konto. There's guys that do manzai. The rare occasion, people that can do both. Um, and then there's people that do pingye, like, uh, you know, one person. But from my, you know, foreign, you know, American perspective, manzai is really cool, man, because it's like, you know, traditional Japanese comedy, you know, with the mic and it's, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah. No, I definitely think Manza is the coolest because yeah. it's the most uniquely Japanese. Yeah, yeah. And also I like how they are relying on nothing but their voice. Large. I mean, they hit each other and they're stuff yes, like that. But yes, like Konto, yes. sometimes you got props and, and you're relying a lot on visuals, yes. whereas Manzai is very just linguistically heavy. And I think that that's really yes, cool as yes. someone who is such you're a right. big fan of just the Japanese language and of and of pursuing language ability. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and I'm also curious. So personally, were you kind of studying up on certain Japanese comedians and trying to like find out what made them tick? Like, did you have your favorite Manzai groups that you would try to imitate the style of or be inspired by? So, dude, I was watching, you know, it, oh, man, I was doing, I was so immersed in this that I was, you know, going to the school, sometimes finishing at 10 and then going home and just watching DVDs and not being able to sleep because I was so excited. Comedy DVDs. Yeah, yeah. And just to let you know, it's almost impossible. I mean, you can write jokes. I have written funny jokes, but even now I leave, mostly leave it to my partner. I, I know how to do the delivery really well, but... I studied, I mean, I was obsessed, man. And I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this, but it, you know, I'm assuming Japanese, you know, my company's gonna hear it. But I got hired before I was allowed to get hired and they'd already set us up in the company. So I was already learning from like senpai. I see, like you'd go to their shows. Yeah, because my company's, you know, has tons of famous people. So I'm already going there and watching them, what they do and stuff like that, you know? Cool, cool. So, so you're saying that your partner is the one who does most of the joke writing? Yeah. yeah. And so I, I think that is a pretty normal thing, right? For one person of the two to be the person who creates the actual jokes and stuff? Yes. And it really should be me. It should always be the bouquet that writes the jokes because it's the bouquet that's actually writing oh, really? the jokes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's instances where it's going to be write the jokes. And I have written jokes before. I, I've written, you know, there was times when I, when it was just me writing, but I prefer him to write it and then he'll send it over to me. I'll add some new jokes in, maybe switch some stuff. And now there's just no ego anymore because we've been doing it for 10 years, you know? Yeah, that's that's so interesting. I, I had never heard of that the bokeh is normally the one who writes the jokes. Do you think yeah. there's any real practical reason for that? Or is it just a convention? Yeah, it should be always the bokeh that writes the jokes. Uh, because, the you know, this is all suspension of disbelief. So if the bokeh is acting stupid but he didn't write it then he's not then it's not really him that's interesting but the skomi can still be the the skomi oh i guess because he's the straight man right yeah he's the straight he's not supposed to be the guy being writing the stupid stuff but the yeah exactly and a lot of the time this isn't all the time but a lot of the time when you hear people say the bokeh wrote it they're not really writing it it's really the skomi and they just don't tell people like my partner never tells people that okay okay because it's kind of like going against the grain in a way yeah, yeah. I mean, it just, it makes it less funny because they're like, oh, he thought of it, but he's saying it? What? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah. It's just incongruent with the actual performance, you know? Yeah. And I, we're, we're kind of assuming a lot of knowledge on how Manzai works. So, I mean, to give just a quick rundown, like, yeah, Manzai, right, is, is comedy that's done with two people having a conversation with each other, normally for like, I guess you said three to five minutes, generally. Yeah. I mean, now for pop manzai, there's there's manzai that goes on for 20 minutes, 30 minutes too. But And then, so there's two roles, right? One person is doing bokeh and one person is doing skomi. So how would you describe in English what those two roles are? So this is, that. I mean, uh, even what I'm writing about right now with my dissertation, I'm basically kind of almost breaking that, break, you know, throwing that idea away. But I think that idea is true and I think it's important to give the foundations. There's a tsukomi, yeah, like you said, the straight man, and there's a bokeh who says the stupid stuff. So 
The way Manzai works and you get laughter from Manzai is The bokeh says something that's not conventional Something out of the box And you get a little laugh and everybody's like what, what's he talking about? And then Tsukomi says The Tsukomi is supposed to be the voice inside the audience's head so they say something that everybody is thinking and that everybody laughs because they were all thinking the same thing it's like jerry seinfeld with observational comedy he's just skulming the world mm -hmm. basically on his own pajamas have got to be the world's funniest clothes who designed them to look that way like a little tiny suit <laughs> you notice <laughs> little collar buttoned down <laughs> and a breast pocket there's a useful item <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I also, I think maybe this would be a good time to ask you about your thoughts on Japanese comedy in general, just taking a little aside from your personal narrative, because one thing that sometimes I feel is like sometimes done well, there's a certain rhythm to the way that the, the manzai plays out that just feels really good to listen to. And you get kind of sucked into, into that rhythm. Yes. But there's other times where I feel like what the Tsukomi is saying is kind of very obvious, right? Because like you said, it's what everyone's already thinking. Yes. So it almost feels redundant. And when you compare it to a show like The Office in the West. People say, oh, it's dangerous to keep weapons in the home or the workplace. Well, I say, it's better to be hurt by someone you know accidentally than by a stranger on purpose. It's all bokeh. Yes. And there's almost no tsukomi. There's a little bit, there's like Jim, right? But for the most part, it's just bokeh on top of bokeh and it worked because it's like well we are doing that's going in our mind anyway so we don't need them to yeah. go out of their way to do it yes well i can give you a really good example of uh something that's not japanese but almost japanese you know arrested development that sounds familiar oh uh, okay you got to check it it's about like this really dysfunctional rich family and there's one guy who's normal and then the rest of the family are all screwed up and he's the tsukomi and the rest of the family are bokeh I see. It's a really famous American show. I'm sure a lot of people who watch this have seen it, but it's like that. And so what do you feel that the Tsukomi is adding by saying the thing that people are already thinking? The Tsukomi is reinstating a conventional thought process. So the thought process that everybody's thinking and they're a green light that you can laugh. It's like the laugh track on Full House. So do you think that that is something that inherently appeals to a Japanese audience more? than a Western audience? Yes, yes. I think people are much, I think uh, like embarrassment from out of place laughter is probably a bigger thing here. And by the way, the Full House thing was from a senpai, a foreign senpai who goes to Yoshimo, uh, from Yoshimoto. His name is Chad Mullane. He's been doing it for like 30 years. Oh yeah, yeah. I I've seen some of his stuff. Yeah, but um, some scolding is really funny and a lot of it sometimes reminds me of actual, you know, observational comedy in the States, so. I mean, in some ways, it's not that different, maybe. Cool, cool. And so I guess just going back to you a little bit. So but you are bokeh, right, you said? Yes, yes, yes. And so how did that come about? Like when you were working with your partner, how did you decide who's going to be Tsukomi and who's going to be bokeh? Well, if somebody's going to say something abnormal, wouldn't it make more sense? And wouldn't it be a lot easier for somebody like me who doesn't know Japanese culture to say something <laughs> abnormal? Yeah, that was what I was wondering, but yeah, that totally makes sense. I mean, in a way, it would almost be funny if um, if you were actually the straight man, because it was like the guy who everyone would think would be the bokeh was actually the straight man, you know? Well, I can tell, I was just going to mention that. So there's, you know, there's a lot of half comedians in Japan, and they look like foreigners to Japanese people. Like, from my perspective, they look, you know, Japanese too. But Japanese people can't tell the difference between me and a half person, so... In that case, the half person may only speak Japanese because they never learned another language. So they'll be hyperbolically Japanese and the Japanese guy will be the one that's the bokeh. And then through breaking expectations in that way, it makes it pretty funny. Yes. Yes. That happens a lot in, with half comedians. Yeah, that makes sense. And so in your case, so do you feel like, I mean, I'm guessing the answer is yes, but I just to ask you anyway, like, do you do you feel like you still have to be funny? to perform a joke that someone else wrote and make it land well? Yeah, it's just as important. I, I don't think it matters at all who wrote it. Like uh, Richard Pryor, probably the best comedian of all time. He had writers writing some of his stuff. So 
I, I would say even the performance is more important. You know, I could write the worst manzai in the world and give it to like, you know, Zaki Yama-san, he's like a really mm -hmm. famous comedian here. I bet he could do it, make it funny from his performance. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. And so do you feel like you're someone who's naturally funny and was always funny? Or nope. do you feel like it was mostly something you had to actually cultivate through practice? Nope, I am not funny. I suck. <laughs> uh, I've, I've met geniuses. I know like two or three. Actually, I know more. Uh, there's there's guys that are I'm good at music actually <laughs> I mean like writing songs and I I just never did it for 10 years because I was so into comedy and I understand how it works there's people like that with comedy who I don't know how what it's the way they say it it's the way they think about it anybody who wants to look at Japanese comedy and see a genius they should check out Wada Fujinaro They're, they do konto but I think they're the funniest comedians in Japan and they used to be in some music but that's an example of somebody who is just not a normal person. There's something wrong with them. I mean, they're weird, extremely weird people, these c comedic geniuses, but. And so could you just watch his conto and understand that he's a comedic genius or would you have to have that behind the scenes to understand, oh, he's not someone who worked for it. He's someone who just has this gift essentially. I think if there was subtitles, you might not laugh, but you might be like, oh, this would work in America. And I think there's lots of Japanese comedy that do doesn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how you can tell. And so it's really interesting to hear you say that you're not funny, even though you're a comedian. And I don't know, I've never talked to another comedian before. So if I grab 10 like Japanese comedians or, or comedians anywhere, how many of them would you think would say that they don't think they're actually funny? Um, I'm not sure, but I don't think 99% of them are actually funny. And I think I'm funny now. <laughs> not to... Yeah, yeah. So you, you mean like that you weren't naturally funny, you had to become funny through hard work essentially yeah and i mean I'm, like i do like you know radio stuff a lot um i'm a lot better at that me and my partner because we're so you know it's stuff that comes up naturally is really easy to make funny that's why stand-up's like the hardest thing in the world and they stand-up comedians in america always make fun of radio people because they're like you guys don't have an audience people aren't putting pressure on you mm -hmm. you don't have to make people you know making people laugh on stage is the hardest thing ever oh yeah so you know, and I'm actually may, might not even do it again because, you know, I've been doing it for so long. I've done, you know, a thousand, maybe more shows and, uh, you know, I make people laugh, but I don't know what else to do with it now. And after Corona, you know, th what they're planning on doing now on the stages is just covering everywhere with saran wrap. So you're like b behind a wall of saran wrap. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I see. Yeah, that that sounds like a little bit of a buzzkill for sure. Yeah. So. For you personally, like today, how funny do you find Japanese comedy overall compared to like Western style stand up? Oh man, this is, I think this is just the American part of me that uh, is just a result of me being, you know, alive longer in America. But I think uh, Western comedy is deeper. Yeah, I feel the same way, but I'm always hesitant about my own judgment because I'm always wondering is this a fair assessment or am I failing to fully understand what's going on with the Japanese comedy? It is really comparing apples and oranges, but I would say if you translated Japanese comedy into English, I mean, say it was in perfect English and you played it around the world with, you know, all over TV compared to stand-up comedians, I think more countries would be say, oh, stand-up comedy is funnier. Western comedy is funnier. Yeah, but that's tricky because I feel like if you translated like Dave Chappelle or, you know, Louis C.K. into Japanese, it would not be funny at all. Yeah. And, and that's the funny thing is like a lot of times I will show Japanese people some comedy that I like with Japanese subtitles. And when I'm doing that, I'll watch it from their point of view. I'll assume that I only understood the subtitles and didn't know the English. And it's not funny. I can get it from their from the Japanese sensibility. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they don't trans, but they don't translate. It's not translated right. I mean, there's no right way. You can't translate it. So, yeah. Yeah. That's why I said it's apples and oranges. Yeah. I mean, I was I've laughed out loud harder to Louis C.K.'s newest uh, special than I have probably to any Japanese comedy I've ever seen. I think, maybe not, but. Yeah, and like, for me, I kind of feel like Japanese comedy, a lot of times it, it, it exists almost in a vacuum yeah. where they very rarely comment on what's going on in the real world yes. or, or what, what happens in day-to-day -day life. They're kind of creating something funny out of nothing. And in a way, I think that's really impressive how they really really can just kind of like out of nowhere create something. And I think a lot of times you need the two people to do that, right? It's like the dynamic between the two people that allows them to really create something out of nothing in a sense. 
Whereas a lot of the most popular stand-up comedians are riffing off something that everyone who is watching is experiencing directly. And that's a big part of what makes it funny. Well, I, I would say one, you know, key aspect of that is the purpose of entertainment, I would say is a little bit different in the States compared to Japan. I would say, uh, you know, like the reality TV show has always been huge, you know, for years now, right? Mm -hmm. We're really interested in normal episodes of normal people in the States. And with Japanese comedy, it's like Disneyland, crazy colors, really fat people, really ugly people, really beautiful people. You know what I mean? It's like a way to escape the real world. Yeah, that's that rings so true to me because yeah, I I was just thinking the other day I was watching uh, Otozehi. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, with, uh, old yeah. Movie? And how I mean that's a really funny show. I love that show. But yeah. I was just thinking how the set it's like they have all these weird outlandish objects everywhere in the set. It it does look like a sort of Disneyland type of thing. Yeah. And I was thinking like for my Western sensibilities, it feels kind of goofy. Yeah. Like I would prefer it to just look more professional or formal in some way. But it, that makes sense given what you're saying. Well, I think the Japanese entertainment industry is just more ostentatious in general. Is that the right word? I think that's the right word. Mm -hmm. Like flamboyant. Uh, I, I wanted to use that word at some point. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's just uh, really, uh, it's, an, it's more of an escape for sure. And do you have any theories as to what kind of historical context led that to come about compared to how entertainment came about in the West? I don't know, but I mean, just imagine how much more stress workers have here, how much more they work, <laughs> you know, what would you, would you, do you want to go home and watch how everyday life is? No, you want to see, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Or like, yeah, maybe at the end of the day, they don't want to go home and have their like values challenged or like, have, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. They just want to be, uh, yeah, have someone accept their values and yes. mirror what they, what they already just want to feel and things like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's really interesting. And so kind of just before we leave this comparison between West and, okay. and Japan when it comes to comedy. So do you feel like the skill of being funny that you've cultivated in Japan is something that is universal in the sense of it would enable you to be funny in English as well? Or do you think it's specific to Japanese comedy in Japanese? No, I'm better at talking in Japanese. And talking in the sense of like being funny? My performance of talking like people listening to me and sounding like you know when you hear somebody who's really good at talking you just get like a sense of like satisfaction from it mm -hmm. totally i think mine i think mine's better in japanese than it is in english like even outside of comedy just in general just like if you're going to give a talk even just outside of comedy because you know why when i had my wedding speech i sucked and i was really <laughs> nervous and if it was japanese i would not have been nervous and i would have been amazing <laughs> i'm sure of it so do you think it's the type of thing where if you were going to go back to the States and you decided that you wanted to try to make it as a stand-up comedian, your learning curve would be better than someone who's never done comedy before because it's just a matter of learning how to translate what you learned in Japan over to English-style comedy? The only thing that would, that would work to my advantage, and it's a big advantage, is not, they say, like, my heart wouldn't break if I start, like, if people thought I sucked. Yeah, like you got really thick skin. Yeah, I think that's a better word. I'd, I'd say it takes you about, oh man, I don't need, maybe it was seven years, six, seven years to learn how to do that, man. Maybe there's people that are naturally able to do that. I don't think it's a good thing to naturally have thick skin, actually, because it means if you suck, you'll just keep sucking and it doesn't bother you. I see. I see. So you mean you, you want to have the right amount of thickness of skin? There's like an ideal amount where yes. you'll still be motivated to improve, but you won't be so devastated by negative feedback that you freeze up and quit, essentially. Yes. And when you don't get laughs on stage, and this is the exact same thing, it's worse for stand up comedy because you're by yourself. At least with Monzai, there's one other person to join you with the pain. You know what I mean? But uh, that is such an advantage. And now, you know, everybody bombs. Even, you know, we all, I listen to like Joe Rogan. I'll talk about how bad he bombed the other day. And he's been doing it for, I don't know, 30 years or something like mm -hmm. that. So once you can learn to. Okay, I'm sucking right now, but I'm just going to keep going at 120%. I'm just going to keep keep it up. Then, you know, that's a really important skill with comedy. And that would carry over. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Because look, with any skill, you have to fail a lot to get better. It's yeah. like through your failures that you find out how to improve. Yes. And so if every time you fail, it's such an emotional blow that you, you can't practice for a couple weeks, then yeah, of course, the amount of practice you're going to be able to put in is going to be pretty small. And then you're going to improve really slowly. 
So it totally makes sense. You have to have that ability to get back up right as, uh, after you've gotten knocked down so that you can put in the reps for the next day, essentially. Yes. One more thing that might carry over is uh, how you learn how to ignore embarrassment. So that's not, re that's not really language. That's just like when it's your job to embarrass yourself so much, you just don't care anymore. So that, that might help me too. But I'd have to learn how to do the com comedy. It would be a diff it's a completely different uh, animal. One difference though between Western and Japanese comedy is that there aren't really any hecklers in Japanese comedy. So if you suck, people are gonna be like, you suck, you know what I mean? When that starts coming, I don't know if I would break down. Maybe I'd break down after that, but. I see, I see. But they still don't laugh, right? They So is it more like in Japan, if you suck, it's just silence? Yeah, dude, sometimes that's just as bad. That is worse than a heckler, just when yeah, nobody it reacts like it. it. Dude, I. <laughs> Do you know R1? It's like the, it's a comedy competition for like, you know, ping gaining, like people doing it by themselves. So I wrote with another comedian, a joke for me to perform. Mm -hmm. I thought it was hilarious. It's like, I'm, you know, I come out on stage and I'm going to explain to the audience, like, uh, you know, what stand up comedy is, you know, and I bought all these fake rats that look like real rats. And while I'm explaining, like, a rat would, like, fall out of my sleeve or, like, I'd try to drink a glass of water and the rat would fall on my face and there was just, like, 20 rats hidden all over my body. And I thought it was, like, I mean, like, whenever I tell people in English, they're like, that's hilarious. That's, but no, everybody was just, like, <laughs> and, dude, it was so traumatizing. I will never do anything that's not Manzai ever again. It was I mean, I would have preferred hecklers. Yeah. That's hilarious. Do you ever feel like they're expecting something different because you're a foreigner? And so that actually gets in the way sometimes? Yeah. Or where they're like, oh, he's a foreigner, so he's going to do American Joku or something like that. And so they actually, like, even if you were to, to do something that if a Japanese person did, would get a laugh for whatever reason, because it's you and they're like thinking about irrelevant things because, oh, he's a foreigner, so it's blah, 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 like it's in the way. You can never move beyond being a foreigner. That was my mistake with that. You, that's the only thing you can ever do. Unless it's like a radio talk show or something where it's past the joke. But the, a manzai, I'm writing about this now. I think this is just my opinion. Um, and I think if you asked a lot of agencies, they'd say the same thing. Manzai is a means to an end where stand-up comedy is the end and the means. Mm. So manzai is a three minute business card. Japanese comedians don't carry business cards. Your business card is your manzai, and when somebody on TV sees you, you from your manzai, they call you onto the talk show. They call you onto the radio show. So it's a means to become a famous person. It's not. I mean, some people do do manzai, but you know the m main motive is to make you become the product, not the manzai, the product. Where I would say a lot of the time in the states or like the person is the product and. Their performance is a product. That's super interesting. But yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. And so I guess maybe that'd be a, a, a good point to return to your personal narrative on a, a little bit. So like eventually what, when you joined the actual comedy company and now you are doing Monzai professionally, how did things unfold from there? How was your experience of essentially trying to become a famous person, like you said, in Japan. Because I know in Japan, there is this kind of idea of like, you're just a professional famous person. Yeah. And of course, you might be a, a Manzai main, but yeah. even more than that, yeah, you're just a professional famous person. So what was your experience of taking part in that world? Okay, I'm going to make this really clear first. I would, I'll say that I've never been famous. I was on TV. I've been on almost every single big Japanese TV show there is. Not as like an extra, but as, you know, somebody on the panel. I forgot when this was, but the first year I started when we got on that joke competition, I was on Sama Golden, which is like the show everybody wants to get on. I was on, you know, uh, Nakai no Mado. I was on all these shows. And, I, and when I say I wasn't famous, I mean, people were coming up to me every day outside and saying, oh, let me shake your hand. Can I take a picture and stuff like that? So that's kind of famous. You know what I mean? Yeah, that sounds like pretty famous. But I would say somebody, somebody like Atsugiri Jason, who's kept that for... Or like, who else? Pakkun? Mm -hmm. Or somebody? I mean, they are like famous people to me. Mine was really short-lived. I sucked, <laughs> number one. It, it came at me too fast. I didn't have the skills to live up to what was coming at me. So what, when you say that, what do you mean you didn't have the skills? Because like, you said that you think that you're funny now, so you got good at comedy. 
But do you mean like you didn't have the skill to like be on the panel and like do all the other famous person activities or? Yeah, I just wasn't funny enough then. And there's a thing, you know, in Japanese, they say kuki o yomu. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to do that. So I talk out of turn. And I, dude, I'm grateful that that never happened, man, because my life would be hell. <laughs> uh, it's really, it would, it would. I, that's not how I wanted, to, you know, if I end up, you know, there's always a chance you might get famous again. You know, that's not, that's not a impossibility but i want to do it while I, when i'm in control and i was not in control of my i didn't know what was going on um it felt really good like my when my family came you know takeshita dori in harujuku mm -hmm. you know like 20 students started screaming and coming up to me and my extended it was my cousins and my uncles they're like oh my god nick you're so famous and then later that day i was in taking i was whizzing in the toilet and my uncle was in the public bathroom too and this guy comes up to me while i'm peeing and he taps me on the shoulder he's like can i take a picture with you when you're done <laughs> it was it was stuff like that and i was actually going to sophia just to learn japanese uh you know the university and it felt good dude it felt good because people were coming up to me and stuff like that and then i lost my visa hmm. and, and i couldn't work for a year how did that happen you couldn't renew it through the company uh yeah the company said they could and then they couldn't just some legal troubles? Yeah, yeah. There was just too many hoops to jump through. And I got it through another business venture that I was doing. And when you start turning down offers for an entire year, then you're done. And people forget about you, man. I mean, rare, people will come up to me. Like, you know, I get recognized like maybe once a month now. I see. Still decent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that, that's probably the best way to do it, man. And the things that I'm doing now, you know, like... The reason why comedy is not big now and why other things are big, like, for instance, I'm going to give you an example. Like, your YouTube, you're providing a service. You're giving them a bowl of really good ramen to eat, and they gain information about language. Mm -hmm. I don't think laughing is enough anymore. I don't, I don't believe that that's enough of a service. So I'm combining the laughing with I, – I work for uh, – so it's kind of a school, but it's, it's like some music, too. It's, and everybody's famous in it. And I have my own show on the streaming service. You know, it's like, I don't know, you know, tens of thousands of kids watch that too, besides the TV shows that I'm on. But I'm applying the language that I learned, the skill of Japanese, the skill of being funny, the skill of speaking, and the skill of being able to teach. And that's giving somebody a product. That's like actually, you know, some, like laughing won't give satisfaction anymore i don't believe that it's possible that's why there's so many good podcasts that's why people for instance listen to joe rogan because mm -hmm. they learn stuff from new people and they laugh they you have to get and I, too many comedians in japan and this is i learned this way too late man i'm i've been a late learner my entire life and i dude I, we shouldn't get a, go on about it but when you're so good to where you're Dave Chappelle or Louis C.K., you can do whatever you want because you're just a comedic genius. But if that's not it, then don't make anything about yourself. Nobody cares just about you. You know, people people are listening to my story right now, but they're not listening it for me. They're listening because they're hearing like a, you know, perspective of somebody else and they can think, oh, maybe I could do this. Maybe You know, and it gives you ideas and stuff like that. But when comedy is just about you, the audience, I don't feel is getting anything i mean unless you're just making them roll on the floor mm -hmm. and they can't wait to see more but that's a rare a rare gift yeah that's true and i mean people do people pe people roar laugh you know i mean of course we bomb but we've made we've murdered places you know hundreds of times but i still don't think that's enough i think you need to add on you know you like especially if you're you want your future to have to do something with language you're gonna have to like combine or stack skills that don't sound like they'd go well together yeah yeah that, that makes sense that's pretty interesting so you're moving kind of away from being someone who is like very reliant on the bigger machine of the company that hooked you up with comedy gigs and things like that and ha now you're kind of planting seeds in different different areas yeah. so you have more independence and in control over what you're doing well, I mean, I'm one of one of the main characters on the biggest children's show in Japan for English, you know, on TVs. And to tell you the truth, that doesn't even give me that much exposure, I feel. <laughs> I, you know, I'll be on like a YouTube channel, like with a friend. And, you know, the, it will get like 300,000 views. And the people were like, oh, man, I laughed so much and we learned English. And I'm like, okay, that's what people want. You know, they want 
to learn something and be entertained at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. And what's that English show called, by the way? Uh, the English show is called Ego de Asobo. I, I hope I don't sound like a douchebag, like <laughs> preaching to everybody. But that this is just from my own experience. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't think so at all. I mean, in, in a way, I... I find it interesting that you're kind of saying that you're glad that you didn't end up becoming famous in the more traditional like Japanese tarento, gay no jin type of way. Because there's always part of me, I think, you know, part of me from when I was younger that was like, oh, man, if I was a famous person in Japan, that would be the coolest thing ever. I'd get to meet other celebrities and be on TV. And there's just this I feel like American culture kind of tells you that that's actually one of the most yeah. desirable things that can happen to you. So you become famous. So did you ever have a phase where you felt like that? Or were you always oh, yeah, kind dude. of... I, when I was single and I wanted chicks and stuff in my early 20s, man. <laughs> but getting famous for being famous is the worst. I mean, I'll give you an ins. Actually, this is from Kakumeno Fanfare. So uh, I can't. I don't want to say her name. But one of the most... She's probably top five most famous people in Japan. She was in, in my company. Two years ago, she... And she was known as the girl next door. And she, you know, she wasn't a comedian. She wasn't a musician. She was famous for being famous. And, you know, she was good at talking and stuff like that. She had an affair with a married guy who was in a super famous band. And all of her supporters left her. She lost all her sponsors, had to pay millions of dollars. The company had to pay, you know. So, you know, when you're being famous for, for just being famous, you get commercials and stuff like that. But then you have to pay them for the commercials that they made and had to cancel. You know what I mean? Mm, I see. So you're losing tons of money. Everybody, and there's also sex. This is obviously also a sexist thing. She got in tons of trouble. This guy, the guy, the other married guy who was a, uh, the married, she wasn't married. He was married, but she got in trouble and he didn't really, you, you didn't really hear too much about him. Yeah, yeah. What Nishino-san argues is there's two different types of people. There's famous people and well-known people. She was well-known. She was basically a dog to all of the sponsors, to all of the people because she, her product is herself. His product was his music, so it didn't affect him at all. I mean, as unfair as that is. Yeah, yeah. So when you're famous for just being famous, you are in a really vulnerable position, I think. Yeah, so it sounds like you're saying basically if you're not providing a unique type of value that other people couldn't easily provide, then you're just replaceable, right? Yeah. It's like as soon as, as you get some derogatory mark on your resume or whatever, well, they can just replace you for someone with a clean slate. And they're going to do that as soon as that happens. Yes. Whereas like with this musician who makes music that no one else could make. Yeah. It's like even if he gets into a little bit of trouble, it's like, well, people still want that music. So he has a safer position. Yes, exactly. Yeah. He's not representing himself. His music is. But, you know, also and then there's also, you know, different, uh, obviously sexist. You know, why? Why was the girl that wasn't married? Why did she get in so much trouble? And the guy that was married, didn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I think Nishino-san had a, a point. And I think there's more people in Japan who are famous for being famous than maybe in the States. I'm not sure about that, but... It kind of seems like that's kind of my impression. Yeah. Because my, my impression is that the Japanese gay no kai, which is kind of like the, the world of celebrities, is more insular yes. than in the West. Where you see all the same people in all the same shows interacting yes. with each other all over. Whereas... It seems like the American world of celebrity is much more dispersed. Yes. There is uh, less internal interaction, less internal clicks and things like that. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's kind of my impression. But so, I mean, it might be kind of rude to ask, but in a way, it seems like if someone was such a legendary comedian, then and essentially they wouldn't be getting famous for being famous. Mm -hmm. They'd be famous because they are this legendary comedian who can make people laugh in a way that others can't. Yes. So are you kind of saying that you saw a path where... You were someone who was decently funny, but not at that level where you were completely irreplaceable. Instead, it was more like gaijin comedian yeah. who is basically famous just for that role. And, yeah. and, and it's not really you as Nick. It's just you as gaijin person who's a manzai artist or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, I'm, I'm not saying this like narcissist. I mean, I still think I'm probably more funny than I, I mean. Oh, you know who's more funny than me? Dave Spector. He's, he's more funny than besides him. I'm not sure. I, I mean, Bobby was it also, but I mean, for a foreigner, it's pretty funny, but you have to be, yeah, you have to be a genius. I feel to do that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Especially because there's so many people who want to be a Japanese comedian and stuff like that. There's so much competition. Oh yeah. Yeah. Dude, there's, I mean, in Yoshimoto alone, I, I don't know, 5,000, 6,000 comedians. 
Yeah, that's that's crazy. So it totally makes sense that you're, you'll be easily replaced unless you are a true genius. There's so many other people who want that position. And dude, also, you know, there's not a selling out. You know, Americans really care about, oh, this dude sold out, this guy sold out. Like in Japan, that's not a thing. Like Japanese people are just nice. I think Japanese people are just, you know, nice about stuff like that. But when you're a comedian in Japan, you better, if you're still doing jokes, You'll make lots of money, man. You'll make, you know, a couple grand, a grand an hour, two grand an hour, more than that for doing these jo- like corporate gigs all over Japan. But you'll be do- doing that same joke for the rest of your life. Yeah, I see. Imagine doing that. Because it's, it's not like stand-up comedy where, it, you know, there's earworms a lot in Japanese comedy. You know, like things that sound good, like, <laughs> you know, like stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And everybody's waiting to hear that. So you're going to be doing, that's going to be your job. Going to this part of Japan, doing this joke. Next, two hours later, you're doing the same joke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That would drive me nuts. I mean, yeah. For me, that I always thought that was super lame because it's like, well, you've already heard the guy say his catchphrase a million times, so how is that going to be funny? It seems like the essence of humor is breaking expectations, having your own expectations broken. And it's the exact opposite of that because it's you're hearing the same thing every time. But I guess Japanese people just seem to really get a kick out of that. You know, it's like, I guess they want to hear him say the famous line. Which is why I say, ideally, the joke should be a means to an end. So the joke should make it so you you transcend the joke. You know, like people like, you know, Sanma-san, Imada-san, uh, Matsumoto-san, they're just like comedy personified. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So there, nobody's waiting for their same line every single time. They just want to hear everything that they have to say. Yeah, totally. And I think this is true also like Beat Takashi. Like I remember... Like for a while, I didn't even know that Beat Takashi was originally a comedian because I just saw his like vi- like violent movies. Yeah. And then later, I-, I learned more about his comedic career, and I saw you can go to his Wikipedia page. They have this super long list of all of his jokes that his like mochineta, you know, like yeah. the-, the characters that he would play or his catchline things. So it's like, yeah, he has so many that he's not pinned down to any one. But then there's the other. There's more other things like Imo the Show with like Hashi Sensei. Imo the Show. Or yeah. Like the Kojima Yoshio. Yeah. You know. By the way, my wife was his manager. That's oh. how I met my wife. Awesome. Wow, yeah. Yeah. What, what was his? His is Sonna no Kanke Ne. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you know, dude, he's really smart, super positive, an entrepreneur, but he's, you know, he's still doing that joke, you know, probably every single day. Yeah, yeah. Like, for everyone yeah, who doesn't know, it's like, this guy is associated with this one joke. Yeah. And the, the connection is so strong that he can't really do anything else. I mean, I, if I was making, I don't know how much he makes, but if I was making a certain amount of money, I'd do it too. Shit. Yeah, and so how much more time do you have, by the way? Uh, I don't have that much more time until 12.30. We can even do a part two another day if you want to, man, if we don't finish it today. So Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, so I guess just in the, yeah, in the interest of time, there's a lot of stuff that I would want to ask you about the game. Okay, sure. I'm really curious about. But I guess just to finish off where we started in this video, your personal narrative. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that you went to Sofia. Are you still going? You mentioned that you're working on a dissertation. Okay, so I studied abroad when I was in... Uh... That's why I said I was here a little bit longer, a little bit before 2008, because I studied abroad for one year in my uh, junior year of college. And then I think it was around 2013, I went back just to learn more Japanese. I just want to get my Japanese a little bit better than I can talk on TV. You know, I might learn some new vocabulary, stuff like that. And then two years ago, I think in the winter, I was like, you know, I was planning on never doing grad school. I didn't see the point of it, especially if it's something like Japanese studies. Mm hmm. But uh, I realized that in Japan, people will listen to you depending on your background. The comedy qualifications you have. Yeah, you, you go to Todai, people are going to listen to you more than if you go to like a not famous school. Mm-hmm. If you have, I don't know about master's, I think PhD. I don't know if I'm going to do the PhD. I'm not really interested in staying in academia that much longer. But uh, if I have a PhD. I'll be on more shows for sure. And mm-hmm. people, even if I'm an idiot, which I am, people will still believe anything I say, which is what, one of the reasons why I wanted to get it. But I didn't think getting the PhD would be this hard. So, which I haven't even started yet. I'm still on my master's, but the PhD sounds just like torture. So I, I'll just live with the master's and try to sound as smart as possible with the master's. Cool, cool. And so what are you doing your dissertation on? So it's about manja and it's... Uh, it's um, Dude, it's changing all the time, man. What I talked about on Bilingual News now to me just seems like, you know, the the tip of the iceberg. Now <laughs> I just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper. I don't think anybody's written about Manzai. And, you know, I think a lot of comedians would agree with me on this. Comedians 
everywhere around the world don't like it when people that don't do comedy write about comedy because you don't understand it unless you do it. So, you know, I'll, I'll read something about somebody who's like, yeah, I did Monzai for a year or something like it. No, no, no. You got it. You know, you're not a comedian until you've done it for 10 years. Yeah, yeah. And there's just not that much writing about Monzai. So, I, you know, I'm writing about Monzai. Um, I'm using some, uh, I don't, I just don't want to give it away yet, but I'm using some other famous scholars theories to apply to Monzai and to show how it's just this unique mix between tradition and reinvention in order to make basically you know, like a business card or a product to sell comedians on a mass scale. Yeah, that sounds super interesting. I'd love to read it. All right, now, are you writing it in Japanese or in English? Uh, I'm writing it in English. Um, I, I'm using Japanese sources, but when I finish it, we can do it again. We can. I can send it to you. It's not going to be that long, so you could read it. And we could talk about it because I'm sure we could. There'd be so much to talk about just from that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to do that. That's, that sounds awesome. Yeah. And so, I guess just just to kind of conclude with your current narrative. So you kind of mentioned some other projects you're doing, like helping off learning English and yeah. and things like that. So are you planning on staying in in Japan indefinitely? It sounds like you have a family. No. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what I would do for work, man. It, it, like it wouldn't make. I, you know, I'd miss America a lot, but I just don't know what I. I don't know what I would do. Like I've, I've acquired these like really niche random skills that. I mean, I'd have. To, I'd end up having to become like a university teacher or something like that. There, right? Probably. Yeah. So I mean, that totally makes sense on a, on a practical level. Yeah. But if it uh besides those factors, like, do you enjoy living in Japan more than living in the states? Oh yeah, especially now, dude. <laughs> I mean, just. Uh, uh, like the freedoms that we had during Corona that no other country had, I don't take for granted. Um, I also don't take for granted how Japanese people without set laws, they still follow rules and stuff like that. It's safe, dude. In four years, my son will be able to walk to school. Uh, I can pay all my bills at the convenience store. Dude, I don't even know how to pay my bills. <laughs> I, I became an, a, an adult here. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm sure like after after a certain period of time, you will spend a majority of your life in Japan, right? Maybe not even too far into the future. There's good things about America, though, man. There, there's amazing things that I miss. Oh, yeah? Like what things? Innovation. Um, I don't think it's any better or deeper, but this companionship is different. The way friends talk with each other. I mean, I have foreign friends here, so I can usually take care of that. Um, just the, the way, uh, like, you know, I, I went to Europe and the same thing. People are just not braver, but what's the word? Just uh, more, maybe less, maybe it's less polite. Maybe it's brave. Maybe it's less polite. I don't know which one it is. More direct. Yeah, direct. Good word. Yeah, yeah. And and I think I already know the answer to this, but do you have any interest in trying to basically become a Japanese person or 100% assimilate into, into Japanese society and get treated the same way as everyone else? Or are you more kind of enjoying the balance between Playing along with their rules, not not being obnoxious, but also enjoying your your get out of jail free card, being a foreigner on all, on many things. Yeah, of course, number <laughs> two, right? Also, man, I mean, uh, and this isn't a bad thing at all, but it's a, look at me. They'll they'll never, you know, they're never gonna think of me as a Japanese person. I don't blame them. I don't look like a Japanese person. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you you, you t use it as advantage. You know. Cool, cool, and I guess just. Uh, final question. Are you considering maybe learning another foreign language or was it really not learning a foreign language that interests you, but just learning Japanese? And so you're not that interested in learning other languages. Dude, this is such a cliche thing to say, but I think if you have, I think having the passion for it is, you know, having the motor for it is the main driving force that decides if you can speak a language or not. You know, I tried Chinese. Um, I tried Chinese and I gave up within a week uh, just because I, you know, with, with Japanese, I really wanted to speak Japanese. Yeah, totally. Like I've been trying to learn Chinese for a while and I have a... Well, it's harder too, right? Well, I think that knowing Japanese, it, it was it's going to be easier for me to learn Chinese than, than learning Japanese because I already know the characters and things like that. But overall, it's like, yeah, the motivation isn't there. Uh, and so I end up not putting that much time to it and my progress ends up being really slow. Well, and I, I'm in general, um, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an idiot, but I'm like, you know, kind of a slow learner. It takes me a long time to learn stuff. And, you know, what I do with Japanese, you know, I think if anybody puts in the work, they can definitely do it and probably faster too. So I would never recommend anybody to go to a comedy school or something like that, but I would definitely recommend people who want to learn the language to think about how they want to use that in the future, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, it's cool. It's cool that you're interested in, in teaching and helping other people learn, because I think that people who, I mean, it's kind of weird to say a slow learner, but people who do struggle themselves a lot to learn something are going to end up being the best teachers because they're going to have the most intimate experience when it comes to overcoming all the difficulties on the path. If someone's just a genius and they pick it all up really easily, they're not going to be able to relate to other people who are uh, who need extra help with learning it. And so they might actually be a really bad teacher. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think it was Nietzsche that said he wishes upon his enemies, like, that they fall into the pit, that they ha they have to suffer. And he was saying it, you know, because he was wishing that it's through the suffering that you grow, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, well, thanks so much for, for coming on. And yeah. Yeah, hopefully we can do a part two because there's still so much interesting stuff that I think we can cover. Yeah, dude, I, I'd love, love to do a part two. Uh, is there any content that you uh, want to shout out? Uh, yeah, yeah. Follow me on Twitter. It's at Time Bomb Ganon. Time Bomb. It was G E I N I N. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Thanks again so much for coming on, and I definitely hope we can do a part two. Yeah, dude. Uh, keep in touch, and we will. Awesome. All right, man. See you guys.